Good morning, church. So beautiful to be in the house of the Lord one more time. He got us up this morning. So let's give him a big thanks. Thank you, Jesus. As the song was being played, it was so beautiful to listen to the different tones as it come out. Also this morning, as we go to the throne of grace, we want to remember the pastor and the group that went with him to Honduras. We want to keep them in prayer until they return back safely to us. Jesus, we know you can and we know you will. Father, as I said, I come one more time asking you, your mercy, to look upon all of us this morning and to let us know that you're still in a soul-saving bed. Thank you, Jesus, that you got us up and started us up on our way. It's so glorified just to call your name Jesus. Wonderful Jesus. But keep us, Father, which is in heaven. Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. In your name, Jesus. Amen. How about now? All right. Okay. Well, if you want to follow along, turn your bulletin over and you'll find the thoughts that I'd like to present to you today. I don't know what you think preachers do, but preaching is an interesting thing. You sometimes, as a preacher, you wonder what sermon, what message is appropriate? What's the thing to do? And when Kevin first mentioned to me about coming today to fill in for him, I thought I knew what I was going to preach. In fact, I was going to go ahead and preach a Father's Day sermon since next Sunday is Father's Day. And I will have to be at another place preaching. And so I thought, well, I'll just preach Father's Day sermon twice. But then I didn't feel comfortable about that. And so honestly, while I was out cutting my yard, mowing my grass, mowing my lawn, I decided to preach a sermon on that topic. Do you cut your grass or do you mow your lawn? You say, what's the difference? A whole lot. Some people cut the grass. And some people mow the lawn. Now, Rick over here, seated by my wife, is a professional. That's what he does for a living. He mows lawns. He rides a big mower. He has a cohort who does the weed eating for him. I'm not sure how he got that cohort to agree to that, but that's another thought. But when I was a teenage boy, I 
cut grass. I mowed lawns to make some money. I cut three a week. I cut one. My father's, my where I lived, he didn't pay me. The other two people paid me $5. That's a long time ago. But I remember it well. And I don't know who taught me, but there was some teaching that I got about how's the best way and what's the difference in cutting the grass and mowing the lawn. I learned, and I I wish I could remember who taught me. It may have been my dad. It may have been one of the people whose yard I cut. But they taught me that when you're cutting the grass, always cut it so that the grass is going into what you haven't cut so that you can recut it because then you don't have to rake it because it's mulching it up. You cut it the other way and it blows out on the sidewalk and you've seen people who do that and they leave it on the sidewalk or they leave it on the street and it looks like a big mess. You follow what I'm saying? And so I was taught to cut the grass so that you blow it towards the inside so that you're going to cut it again. I was also taught if you see a piece of paper, pick it up because if you cut it, you're going to have a hundred pieces of paper to have to pick up. You understand what I'm saying? And I have to confess to you, there are times I, I thought, well, that's no big deal. I just run over that one sheet of paper. And then I realized that's stupid because now that I've got more paper to pick up, if I had picked up the one to start with, I wouldn't have had the problem. Do you get what I'm saying? Cut the grass or mow the lawn. Now, I don't want you to misinterpret what I'm trying to get you to see today. It's not about cutting the grass and it's not about mowing the lawn. It's about doing the best you can do to be excellent in everything that you do. And you'll notice that there are three different verses of Scripture that I have used to try to bring this out. Ecclesiastes chapter 9, verse 10. Whatsoever your hand finds to do, do it with all of your might. Do it with every ounce of fiber of your being. Do a good job. Make it look good. Make it look like something you're proud of when you're through with it. Then Paul says in the book of Colossians 3.23, And whatsoever you do, do it heartily, as if you're cutting the grass for the Lord. Now that's not what it says, but that's what it means. Do it heartily, as unto the Lord, and not unto men. And then one more time, Paul says in the book of 1 Corinthians, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. Now you might be thinking, now come on, Ken. How can mowing the lawn be honoring to God? Because anything you and I do to the best of our ability gives him glory and honor. One of the problems we face in our culture, in my opinion, is sloppiness. You can look at the way people dress. I wonder sometimes if people who ever looked in the mirror before they left home. Because they dress so sloppily, you wonder, where would they come up with that idea? And then you look at them, you, they, what are you looking at me for? Well, I can't help it. You look like you want me to look at you. And so don't be mad because I'm looking at you now. But the point I'm making, God wants you and me to be the best we can possibly be. He deserves the best. He gave us the best. He continues to give you and me blessing. And I think it's only right and proper that we do that to him as well. Cutting the grass and mowing the lawn are not necessarily the same thing. To cut the grass means to merely cut down the blades that have gotten higher. You follow me now? To cut the grass simply means you're cutting down the blades that have gotten higher. To mow the lawn is to spend time making the grass look good. Everybody follow where I am now in your outline there? You want the grass to look good. Had a neighbor of mine come to my uh, watch, was watching me one day cutting my yard or mowing my lawn. And she said, how come your grass always looks so green? And mine always looks so brown. 
I said, do you want me to tell you the truth? She said, yes. I said, you're cutting yours too low. You cut it low, you're cutting the best part of the grass. Cut it high enough so you can still see the green blade. Everybody follow what I'm saying? And I said to her, raise your wheels on your lawnmower so you won't be cutting it down so far that all you've got is brown. Mow the lawn. Don't just cut the grass. Make it look better. The Bible teaches that every, everything that believers do should be with an attitude of excellence. We ought to do the best we can possibly do for the Lord. Give your best is what the Bible teaches. Giving your best means that you try everything within your power to be better today than you were yesterday. To be constantly trying to improve what you're doing to the glory of God. It's to be a pursuit of excellence. Now that's a word we don't hear much in our culture. And that's a word that people sometimes are, quite frankly, too lazy to understand. But I honestly believe the Bible teaches we are to be as excellent as we possibly can be. Not for people to brag upon me and you, but to give honor and glory to the Creator. You look at the created world, it's not sloppy. You look at God's creation, it is beautiful. It is excellent. It, it does what God wanted it to do. In fact, you remember in Genesis when God made the world, everything that he said, it is good. It was good. It was good. He said that over and over and over again. And I'm convinced that that same attitude ought to be for you and for me. The pursuit of excellence, exceeding expectations, moving from good to best. To be the best you can possibly be. The whole concept of doing your best should be based on spiritual truth and some principles. And here's where I want to just kind of be as practical as I know how. In fact, here's what I wanted to do today, what I hope to do today. For the past several weeks, Kevin has done something, to be quite frank with you, I've never heard anybody else do. I've never heard in my life ten sermons from the book of Amos in my life. And Kevin was very clear in the prophecy and what that book means for you and for me. The truth is he also got a little bit political. And so I'm not going to be prophetic today. I'm not going to be political today. I'm going to be practical. I want to tell you how you can do your best, how you can be the best you can possibly be for the Lord. So here are the principles. The first one, the better prepared you are, the easier the task. How many of you mow your lawn once a week or whenever you mow it? How many just cut the grass at some point in your life? Anybody? Raise your Okay. Have you ever gotten up to go cut the grass and find out you didn't have any gas? Have you ever found out that uh, something else is wrong? Maybe the spark plug dead. Well, my point is, if you're going to cut the yard, if you're going to mow the, the lawn or cut the grass, you better be prepared for it. You better be sure you got enough gas. You better be sure if it needs oil. You better be sure that you're ready to go. Because if you don't, guess what? It's going to take that much longer. Am I right, Rick? Uh, you probably have to maybe urge somebody on like a weed eater. Uh, to stay with the task or whatever. But be prepared. Having everything you need for the task makes that task so much easier. And I don't care what you apply that to. A few times in my life I've tried to make a cake. And I have learned if you don't have all the ingredients, it's not going to come out right. My wife will verify. In fact, one time I made a cake to bring here. And when I got through with the cake, it was the sorriest looking cake I'd ever seen in my life. And I found out why. I had used the wrong kind of oil. And the wrong kind of oil don't go with certain ingredients. And we had to throw the dead gum thing away. Because I wasn't prepared. I thought, well, it won't make any difference. The recipe calls for oil. But I found out it doesn't call for virgin oil. And it don't mix 
with the cake ingredient. I wasn't properly prepared. Apply that same principle of being prepared to go to church. You with me? Get up, kids. We got to go. Come on, let's go. Come on, let's hurry, hurry, hurry up, hurry up, hurry up. And we're not in any mood to come to church. And we get here and it shows on our face. You leave home expecting to get something from church. Not going because, well, I got to because if I don't, Kevin's going to call me. One of the elders are going to call me and find out why we weren't there. No, you don't go to church in that attitude. You go to church in the attitude of looking forward to it. You go into the church in the attitude, I wonder what God's going to do today. You go to church expecting God to do something for you and for me. You get ready to come. You try to get here a few minutes early for that matter now. My wife will tell you I'm a fanatic when it comes to that. I hate to be late, and I hate for other people to be late as well. And I'm being honest when I say it. If you're in front of me at the red light and it turns green and you don't go, I'm blowing my horn. Get on it. Because I hate being late. I hate being impatient. I started to say I hate being impatient, but that's not true. I love it. Uh, Because I'm not very patient at all. But the point I want you to see, be prepared. Get ready to come to church looking for God to really move upon our hearts and life. Be prepared. When you're better prepared, life is so much easier. The second principle I want you to understand is this. Putting things off only makes things harder, not easier. Oh, there have been many times I've walked out and I've looked at my yard. Well, it don't look too bad. I believe I'll wait. And I wait... And it rained. And when your grass needs cutting anyhow, and then it rains on it, guess what? It's harder the next time. And if I'd have cut it, the grass would have been better off because it had some fresh rain on that new mold yard. You follow me? Putting things off makes things so much harder. Sometimes we convince ourselves the yard doesn't look too bad anyway. But guess what? It still grows. Spiritual application. You put things off spiritually. It's harder to get back into it. Like, you quit coming to church for a length of time. After a while, you convince yourself, I don't need to go. And I'm telling you as a minister... I think I've heard every excuse in the book about why people don't come. Well, I can worship God at home. All right, tell you what, do. Call that preacher the next time you get sick then. Don't call Kevin. Oh, excuse me. Do you get my drift? You quit reading your Bible after a while, you won't read it at all. Because it's so much harder to pick up but if you continually keep doing what you're supposed to be doing it is amazing how much easier it is for things to go on when you get into the habit of doing it well now brother Ken do you really believe that going to church is that important well I don't think coming to church saves you but I think if you're saved It ought to be the practice of your life to come to church. And I think the Bible teaches that. Whoever wrote Hebrews said it, don't forsake the assembling of yourself together as the matter of some people happen to be. In other words, you quit coming, you'll end up not going at all if you're not careful. In fact, the truth is, Sometimes coming to church is not so much just for you as it is for other people. You see, we encourage each other when we come. When you walk in the door and you see certain people, it can lift your spirits. Particularly when you realize what they may have gone through all week and they made it. Well, maybe my problems aren't so bad after all. Because if they can make it, maybe I can 
And the author of Hebrews goes into that. In fact, he says, the closer the coming of the Lord is, the more we ought to be encouraging one another. And coming to church is an encouragement. Coming to church is not only an encouragement, it's a witness to an unsaved world. That you still believe it's right. That you still believe it is appropriate. But you and I, I'm afraid, sometimes are procrastinators. We just put it off. Put it off. Put it off. Several years ago, I'm not making this up. I read this in the paper. I did not know there was a, an organization called the Procrastinators Club. And they meet once a year, but sometimes they put it off until the next year. Now think that through. But you see, the, the point I want you to see, if you don't stay busy at what God wants you and me to do, it's harder to get back into the groove. Putting things off make, makes things harder the next time. Well... There's a third principle I want you to see, and perhaps the most important principle I could mention to you. Pulling the weeds is a continuous process. Pulling the weeds is a continuous process. Have you ever noticed you don't have to plant weeds? You never go to the farmer's market or the grocery store where they sell or nursery somewhere, nobody goes and buys weeds to plant. And when I get to heaven, one of the questions I want to ask the Lord is, how can weed grow in concrete? How does that happen? I mean, you've had that experience. I've done it. I've gone to Home Depot and I've gotten this grass killer and I go through my driveway where those cracks are and I squirt that goop on that stuff and it comes back. I didn't plant it. In fact, it was there when I bought the house. And I'll guarantee you that owner didn't plant it, but it comes up every year. But you have to continually Pull the weeds. But when you pull the weeds while they're small, it's a lot easier. You follow what I'm saying? I've got a fence row. And if I let those, the weeds grow up on that fence, after a while they can get pretty high and pretty thick. And pretty big and round, it's harder to pull them up. But if I just reach down and pull it up when I see it first come up, man, I can pull it out just like that. Now make the spiritual application. That's how you deal with sin in your life. If you don't deal with sin when it starts out small, it's going to get bigger, I promise you. If you don't deal with the little things in your life that cause you and me to get away from God, I guarantee it can lead to bigger things. Solomon put it like this. The little foxes spoil the vine. In other words, the little things in life can sap your strength and they can become bigger and bigger as you go along. Dealing with the big issues <coughs> later <coughs> makes it even much harder. Like I said earlier, pick up that whole sheet of paper. is easier than picking up a hundred pieces of it. You follow me? But we have to constantly be pulling weeds out of our lives spiritually. You say, Brother Ken, even preachers? Well, what makes you think preachers are any different? If they're different, the difference is this. Yeah, we have as much temptation as other people, if not more. Because the devil likes to trip up. Preachers, and I may have said to you before, but I want to say it to you again. There's a prayer I pray every day. Dear God, keep me pure. Now, no, don't brother kid me. You pray for purity. And if you don't work at it, it'll soon get you. 
And so you have to keep pulling the weeds of impurity out of your life. You have to be careful what you're doing. A fourth principle. Don't wait for someone else to mow your lawn. Now, don't misinterpret that. If you need your yard mowed, see Ricky. He'll be glad to take your business. But that's not what I'm referring to because sometimes it is appropriate to get somebody else to do the work for you. I'm aware of that fact. Because sometimes you, you, you're just not able to do that. And sometimes you need help. But in a spiritual sense, what I'm saying to you, as much as I love our pastor, and as much as I appreciate his preaching, there is nothing any better than you getting spiritual truth on your own. There's nothing more enjoyable than you reading a verse of scripture and all of a sudden the light goes off in your head. Man, is that thrilling. Man, is that exciting. Now again, please don't misinterpret that. I thank God for the, 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 what we do here with the outlines and, and all of that. Because I think learning from other people's knowledge is helpful. But yet at the same time, there's nothing more exciting than you finding something out on your own. And yet so oftentimes we do not do that. So, so many times Christian people are ignorant when it comes to spiritual truth. It's good to learn spiritual truth from others. It's better to learn some things on your own. But yet there's another aspect to this. The church needs all of us. The church is not a one-man show. The church is not a pastor and a board of elders or deacons. No. It's all of us. Whether you are an officer, a staff member, or the pastor, the church needs all of us. And oftentimes in the church, there are some things that go undone because people are not willing to step up to the plate. I don't know where I found this, but years ago I found this, and I want to read it to you. It's a story about four fictitious people. One was named Everybody. One was named Somebody. One was named Anybody. And the fourth one was named Nobody. There was an important job to be done. And everybody was sure somebody would do it. And anybody could have done it, but nobody did it. Somebody got angry about that because it was everybody's job. Everybody thought anybody could do it, but nobody realized everybody wouldn't do it. It ended up that everybody blamed somebody when nobody did what anybody could have done. Now, that's confusing, but uh, if you want to get a copy of that, I'll give it to you. But the point that it is saying is this. Too often times, the work of the Lord goes undone. Because people aren't willing to take their place, to do what they can do within the church. The final principle I want you to see, you can tell by looking if you've cut the grass or mowed the lawn. I'm such a fanatic about it, my wife will verify it. I have gone across the street and cut my neighbor's grass because I got tired of looking at it. I mean, uh, one time we lived at a certain place, and three doors down from us, they never cut their grass. In fact, the house was empty for a long time, and nobody would come and cut it. I got tired of looking at it. It got to be about two feet tall. I took my lawnmower, and I went down the street, and I mowed it. I got through mowing it. The neighbor next door to that house came by and said, Man, I'm so glad to find to see somebody cut this grass. I said, Do you live here? I said, No, I live up the street. Why didn't you cut it? You live next door to it. That didn't go over too well. But the, the, the point is, you know, if you see something needs to be done, you can tell if you've done a good job at it or not. And sometimes you can drive down the street and see... Yeah, they cut the grass, but they didn't clean up the mess. Are you with me? Yeah, they, they, they cut the grass, but they didn't mow the lawn. 
They left all the shavings around. They didn't trim it. They didn't pull up the weeds. They didn't sweep the sidewalk. They didn't sweep the gutter out by the street or the grass. They just blow it out there and expect somebody else to look at it. Well, I got news for you. And maybe I'm being a little bit uh, far-fetched here. But your house looks a whole lot better when you've done a good job with it. Your yard looks a whole lot better when you've taken time to sweep up. Not for the glory of men, but because you represent the greatest person in the world. Some people cut the, cut the grass, but they don't trim, they don't sweep up. Spiritually, we don't work to gain salvation, but we should do the best in every situation. And again, don't miss the point of what I'm trying to say today. I'm not trying to tell you how to cut your grass. I am trying to get you to see there's a difference in cutting the grass and mowing the lawn. Mowing the lawn means you've done a better job. Living for the Lord means that you and I do the best we can possibly do. But then as I close, I must remind you about a couple of things. What we do for Christ, what we ought to do the best we can, you better do it with the right motive. Paul said, we will be judged by our work. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul says, verse 12, If any man builds on this foundation using gold, silver, and costly stones, wood, hay, or straw, his work will be shown for what it is. Because the day of judgment will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire. And the fire will test the quality of what man's work has been. If what he has built survives, he will receive his reward. But if it's burned up, he'll suffer loss. He himself will be saved, but only as one who escapes through the flame. In other words, do the best you can, but do it for God. But give it your all. Give it your gusto. But God will judge the motive. God will judge why you do it. And then Jesus himself said in, in Matthew chapter 5, You're the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden, and neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bushel. Instead, they put it on a stand, and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father, not you. But then I close with one other final statement. If you're going to try to do excellent work for the Lord, or for that matter, everything you do should be for the glory of the Lord anyway. But if you're going to do what you do and do the best you can, get ready for people to make fun of you. Why are you spending so much time with that? Because I want to look good. It looks good enough like it is. Well, no, I want it to be better. I want it to be that which can make me proud, make my neighborhood proud, but more importantly, make God proud. Do your best. Give it your all. And I think you'll find that you'll enjoy your life with God a whole lot more. Let's pray. Our Father, we thank you for the day. <clears throat> we thank you for the time we've been able to fellowship together. We thank you for the music. We thank you for the opportunity to give honor to you through music. We thank you for the opportunity to share together with each other, to just say hello to one another, to shake a hand, to hug a neck, to speak a word of encouragement, to have words of encouragement spoken to us. And Lord, help us to be good at what we do, to strive to be even better, not for ourselves, but because we want people to know we believe the Lord Jesus deserves the best that we have to offer. Again, we pray today that you bless those of our church family who are away. 
protect them, give them health, give them encouragement, speak to their heart, bring them back to us, revived. But then when they come back, help each of us to also be of encouragement to them. Because in essence, they're representing us while they're representing you as well. I pray now that you'll watch over us as we go to our respective homes. Keep us pure. Keep us faithful. Keep us true to you. And all of God's people said, Amen. Do we have the closing prayer, Jeremy? All right. If you'll stand with me, please. We'll say this together. Not me, but we. Not them, but us. Not us, but him. Amen. You are dismissed.